Sergeant Roy Bethke, and he's a 23-year veteran sergeant with the Buffalo Grove, Illinois Police Department. Thanks, Christine. It's an honor to be here today. It's an honor to share a stage with so many passionate, inspirational people. I don't know about the rest of you, but I know that I've at least learned some things today, which is really important. I learned in particular that I'm biometrically unique. <laughs> Thank you for that. Something to take away from today. I want to talk about an idea, an idea that I call Generational Crossroads, Leadership and Change for the Future. But this idea comes from a story. It's a story about me. It's a story about failure. Back a number of years ago, I decided I was going to take a promotional test. And I remember sitting back thinking to myself, what was I missing when I got hired in this job? What didn't I like about the leadership? What didn't I like about my very first sergeant? And I keyed in on one specific area, and that specific area was communication. I thought my sergeant was a very poor communicator. Anybody else think that way? Agree with that? So I took the sergeant's exam. I did okay. It was number two on the list. Got myself to a position to get promoted. I remember walking into work one day. It was 6.59. At 7 o'clock, I raised my right hand, and I said no. <clears throat> was off for a couple of days, went back into work, and I thought, here I am, the new sergeant. I'm going to change things. I'm going to communicate with my employees. So I showed up at work, and I was faced with a whole bunch of people that I'd really never worked with before. Because what, what do we do in law enforcement with new leaders, new sergeants? Where do we go? Midnights, patrol. Hadn't been there in a while. Bunch of people who I didn't know, but I thought, communication, that's the key. So I remember sitting them down and talking to them and telling them what my expectations were. To my utter amazement, they didn't care. <laughs> they didn't do what I wanted them to do. And I quickly realized that what I was missing was that they're different than I am. There are different things that motivate them, that drive them. They have different reasons for being at work. I went back and started working on my master's degree and I actually learned that there's research on this topic of leadership, especially as it relates to different generations, and data, amazingly. So really, this is what I looked like that very first day going into work. I had hair before I got promoted, hard to believe, but I look around the room and I realize many of you are in the exact same boat that I found myself in. So as far as the topic goes, let's talk about some different ideas. Today in our law enforcement workplace, we basically have three generations in the workplace. There are more in society, but we're going to focus on three. We're going to talk about the boomers, we're going to talk about Generation X, that's my generation, and we're going to talk about these millennials. Here they come crashing on the scene, everything's going to be different. Since this is a data organization, let's talk about the raw numbers for a second. Boomers, 80 million boomers in the workplace in America. That's a significant number, isn't it? And we look at Generation X, again, my generation, only 56 million of us currently in the workplace, and that's going to become important as we continue to talk about this. And then here come the millennials, 83 million strong. And many social scientists will say that we haven't even reached the peak yet, because many of them still live at home at mom and dad's. Got out of school, went back to live at home, they're still coming into our workplace today. These millennials, kids born between 1980 and 1999 for our purposes, roughly, they're still coming into the workplace. They're a huge generation. Ultimately, let's think about the change that's occurred in, in each generation's lifetime. We have the boomers. The boomers built the wall, right? The Berlin Wall went up during the boomers' lifetime. The space race was alive and well for the boomers. <laughs> Kennedy gave us a mission, land a man on the moon in 10 years. We did it in less than that. Oh, and then Gen X. We have the Challenger explosion. You guys remember that? Here's a great idea. Let's launch a non-astronaut. Let's launch a teacher off into space, but we can make it better. We can do it on live television with all the kids watching, my generation of kids watching news instantly happen in front of us. And of course, Gen X saw the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Well, why is that important? How does that affect the millennials then? What walls do the millennials currently have? None. We have globalization. How's the space program working out for the millennials? We don't currently have a space program, do we? So let's talk about briefly the boomers so we understand what the topic is. For the boomers in the room, if someone would have said to you an engaged employee 
an engaged employee, what you likely would have thought of is that there was a workplace relationship going on and two people were serious and they were probably going to get married. Is that true? Absolutely. It was a generation where the woman's place was in the house, in the kitchen. Just ask Betty Crocker, ask June Cleaver. So let's talk about Abraham Maslow. He came up with a theory in 1943. In 1943, he published a theory of human motivation. For the most part, what we have is the boomers covering the top or the bottom three tiers of that motivation hierarchy. And then comes my generation, Generation X, neglected by our parents, loyal to relationships, very serious about life, and incredibly stressed out. We were the latchkey kids, because we came home to an empty house. We had to take care of ourselves because dad and mom were at work. We had to learn how to take care of our siblings. For the Gen Xers in the room, think for a moment. What's the first time you had to cook for yourself? What meal did you cook for yourself? I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a grilled cheese sandwich. Almost started the house on fire. Oh, and then, of course, my generation has the yuppies. Remember those? And we have Keeping Up with the Joneses, which, by the way, in Beverly Hills is clearly much harder to do than in Chicago. I learned that yesterday. <laughs> Keeping Up with the Joneses. And if that wasn't bad enough or hard enough for us, we had imaginary television families that we had to try and keep up with, J.R. and the Ewings. Oh yes, but we were the technology generation. I was in high school, I remember working an entire semester in high school to get the cursor of the computer screen to bounce around in a shape that we wanted it to. Really hard work. We're the Palm Pilot generation, the Alpha Pager generation, and yes, very much the bag phone, cell phone generation. Now things improved, we went to the flip phone. How cool is that compared to what you see today? Technology played a huge role in our advancement. Oh, and yes, we're the AIDS generation. When I came into law enforcement in the late 1980s, we actually had police officers telling us we are not gonna do mouth to mouth on someone because it can get us killed. Do you remember how that changed the way that we thought about what we do for a living? It was the advent, the dawn, of the personal protective equipment era. First time we even had a concern about it in law enforcement. Oh, and Maslow again. Gen X is really much more fulfilled than the boomers. We'll go back to that as a theory for just a second. Ah, uh, yes, here come the millennials. The lowest parent-to-child ratio in US history, cherished by their parents, told that you can be anything you want to be, thanks to our friends Dr. Spock, and Mr. Rogers. But is that true? Can you be anything that you want to be? Could I ever have been a brain surgeon? Highly unlikely. We can't always be whatever we want to be. And they look so different than us. The millennials of the generation that invented the low-hung trousers, the underwear hanging out. You could have any haircut you want because you're just expressing yourself. And what an affront tattoos were to the boomers that were leading many of our organizations. People were having conversations about visible tattoos. Can we hire these people? Does it matter? Does it matter where you work, where you live? It's incredibly important. And piercings. How many of us still have policies in place because we're offended by piercings in some certain visible areas? We have excuses for all of this. We talk about officer safety, which is serious, a serious concern, a major issue for us. But how many of the things that we focus on are really concerns, or are they just excuses because they make us uncomfortable? The millennials are also the very first generation in history to not need an authority figure to access information. Let that sink in for a second. They're the very first generation that doesn't rely on, doesn't need an authority figure to access information. For those of you that have been in business for 20 years or so, if you wanted to create a new policy, let's say a new rifle policy or a new intelligence analysis policy, how did you get the information? Probably through that network that you heard about before. Some peer at another organization where you could reach out, you could rely on them. They would take their policy, they would print it out on a printer, they would fold it up, and they would put it in this thing called the U.S. Mail. It had a little stamp that you put on, they'd send it to you. And you called them on a landline, didn't you? And how about today? How much has that changed? If I want to create a new use of force policy, and I go to Google right now, I'm going to have just over 3 million hits in .003 seconds. Now, according to the State Farm commercial, we know that everything that is on the internet is clearly true, right? <laughs> Except that's an issue for us in law enforcement, because my old network 
was very reliable. Those policies had been vetted, they'd been looked at by lawyers, they worked in organizations. These kids don't have that opportunity, they don't have those same networks. They have access to information, but very little understanding of what to do with it. For the boomers, getting their Gen X kids educated was incredibly important. It's one of the things that they worked for. And how is that working out for Gen X and for the millennials? Turn on the news today, one of the topics is gonna to be student debt, the ratio of student debt. We're crushing families, not giving them an opportunity to succeed through education. And what change has this caused as far as education goes generally? How many more schools from Yale to Harvard to Northwestern to UCLA now offer online programs because they understand that's the only way that they can compete? And again, we have that access to information. And then we have this problem. We take computers and we mount them in police cars and we call them mobile. The problem is that when we say mobile, this is what they're thinking about. Thanks to our friends at Apple and Samsung, we will never be able to compete in our environment. Oh yes, excellence in participation. They got a trophy just for playing the game. Here's the problem with no winners and losers. In real life, there are clear winners and losers. In law enforcement, there are losers. 120 police officers were killed in the line of duty last year. 83 have been killed so far this year. We have losers, but we can't lose. We're in a position where we have to win. And how about video games? I remember distinctly one of the first video games I was exposed to was Asteroids. Some of you are like, Asteroids, I remember that game. There's this really cool triangle in the middle of the screen, it's green, right? And it spins. You have a joystick for the youngsters in a room. You have a joystick that you'd spin around, and you can shoot these asteroids before they killed your spaceship. But woe is me, if in fact that asteroid hit your spaceship, you were done. How does that compare today? What are we on, Call of Duty 37? Grand Theft Auto, where you get points for killing cops? significant difference. And we can't figure out in law enforcement why we can't engage these kids. They're used to instantaneous gratification, instantaneous feedback. If you're playing a video game, how long is it before you know if you win or lose? Instantly. How easy is it to know how your friends are doing at that game? Because often you're connected to them over the internet playing with them. But instead, what we do is we line kids up at the police academy based on their level of experience. None. They sit in rows and then we lecture to them. We explain the law to them. And we can't figure out why we can't change that paradigm. Why can't we create that paradigm shift that we're talking about? And then this feedback, dude, how'd I do? The supervisors in the room are like, yeah, I've got that guy. I've got that officer, right? Dude, how'd I do? The problem is that if we aren't giving effective feedback, they're getting it from somewhere. They're getting it from Facebook from Twitter, I won't use MySpace because it's pretty much dead, Snapchat, Kick. But here's my question for you, if we're not giving them effective feedback, the people that are giving it to them are their peers, their friends, other people who lack the experience that we lack, uh, that we have. So they're getting bad information because we are so structured, this broken environment that we continue to work in. These kids grew up in an era of extreme interpersonal violence, from 9-11 to Columbine. Boston Marathon bombings, mall shootings, constant interpersonal violence. Make no mistake, the boomers, they saw violence. We had air raid drills for the boomers in the school. My generation, for the most part, we dealt with natural disaster drills. Today, active, or running up and down hallways with guns, almost like a video game. But that's what they're exposed to, and that's what they're used to. The millennials watched their parents work their fingers to the bone, two working parents only to find out that the era of the pink slip, companies that weren't committed to their employees, police departments that are laying off cops today. We saw the Enron scandal, the WorldCom scandal, we saw the stock market crash. What motivates these kids to want to work hard and keep working? I said that the boomers really lived in order to work. Gen X very much lived in order to work. These kids though, these kids are different. They work to live. Has anybody else experienced that? What do they prefer, time off or overtime? Time off, any day, any time that you can try and give that to them. They love life, that's what they're about. 
Maybe that's the affront. Maybe that's what is so bothersome to the boomers and to us Gen Xers is that they've got it right. They've got it right. I said that. They have that work-life balance. Anybody ever know anybody on their deathbed that said, I wish I would have worked more? <laughs> Not so much. It's always the other way around. And that's problematic for us because it challenges the way we do things. Think about Maslow for a second. The boomers very much filled those bottom three tiers. Gen Xers, one tier higher. If in fact this chart is right and millennials come into the workplace almost completely fulfilled, how do we motivate them? How do we get them to work harder? Because that's what we want them to do, work harder and smarter. That's ultimately what our goal is and what our goal should be. At the end of the day, this talk is about the fact that the millennials are here. They are our future. We can't deny that. There are more of them than there are of us. There are 83 million and still growing millennials in the workplace today. How we choose to engage them, how we choose to teach them, that's what the future is about, and that's what this talk is about, the future. I've heard a number of speakers today talk about the box, inside the box. Sir Ken Robinson, somebody that Brian Gray brought up earlier, he did this TED talk that's really interesting, and he said, you know, if you take a four-year-old, you hand them a piece of paper that has a square, which is what a box is on it, and you hand it to them, they don't know what to do with it. Creativity says they will just start drawing inside the lines, across the lines. It's when the teacher says, oh, no, no, keep it inside the box, that we begin to break creativity. Do we do the same thing in law enforcement? I would submit to you that there is no more box at all. At some point, I thought the box turned into a circle. I actually realized that it's not even a circle. What it is is it's very much a sphere. It's like a balloon, globalization. What's wrong with letting our young officers, our new officers, with ideas, with innovative concepts, come in and push on the balloon? As long as we manage that, the balloon bounces right back to where it started, doesn't it? So maybe that should be the focus. The box is dead. So we have some choices to make. We, the Gen Xers, we, the boomers, we can continue to try pushing the rock up the hill, but how's that going to work out for us? Probably not very well. These kids are looking for a way to connect, a way to get involved in our organizations. They want mentors. They want career advocates. They crave relationships, personal relationships. That's been a topic of several talks today, those personal relationships. They want collaboration because that is the environment they grew up in. They collaborated on video games. They won and lost sporting events together. It's not an individual sport. We talk about innovation, we talk about culture change, but do we understand how to make that happen? Let's make them a part of it. Ultimately, keep in mind that change is a process, it's not an event. A new leader doesn't come in with a magic wand, create a new policy that says we now have a positive culture, Whoo! and there's your positive culture. Culture change is a process, it's a process because the leader doesn't decide what the culture is. The people doing the work decide what the culture is. Things that millennials care most about, that's what we should focus on. We have some control, but we don't have complete control. They care about work schedules. Work schedules are very important to them. Some police departments are already thinking outside the box, outside the circle, outside the sphere, the balloon, and they're doing just-in-time scheduling. Corporate America caught on to this years ago. This is a data analysis organization. Do we not have data that tells us our busiest hour of the day, our busiest day of the week? But yet, generally, we have staffing levels that are inflexible for a lot of different reasons. How cool would it be for your millennial if they could walk into work, look at a blank schedule, and say, I need this many bodies on this day. Just come fill in. You don't have to work an eight-hour shift, a nine-hour shift. You have to work 40 hours in a week or an average of 160 hours a month. All different ways that we can engage that concept. They want task choices. They want relationships. They want task choices. Do we have task choices in law enforcement? We have data analysis, we have intelligence, we have the detectives, we have the motorcycle unit. All different ways that we can give them choice over their tasks. They want to learn, they want opportunities to learn. Often they want opportunities to learn from us, the people who have done it. And it was interesting as I heard one of the speakers talk this morning about the car with the four wheels. 
That's very true of law enforcement officers, very true of these millennials. If you can't give them those first four things, they will move and they will find someplace else to go find those four things. They have no problem moving to Texas, Illinois, although I don't know why anybody would move there, New York, why not just South America? Maybe there's more fun to have there. They're not as deeply committed to their organizational roots because we haven't made that important for them. We're talking about a paradigm shift. That's what we keep hearing today. That's what's in the title, the description of this event. We're talking about a complete change to the way we think and that we do business. If only we would remember the golden rule. How simple this concept is and how much better would it make our organizations, whether you work in a law enforcement agency, a fire department, in corporate America, if only people would treat, treat each other with respect the way that they want to be treated. That's my call for you. When you retire from whatever agency you work for and they put your picture up on the wall, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, what are these new kids gonna think about the person in that picture? Were you the change agent or were you the problem? Thank you very much.